Hi everyone and welcome to Miss Estrick Biology. This video is going to be going through graph questions and it will include exam question walkthroughs as well. If you are new here then just click subscribe so you keep up to date with all the latest videos. So many many students dread these graph questions. They might have really really good knowledge but when they get to a graph question they just get stuck. So that's why I'm doing this video, to give you some help and just try and give you some tips so you can get full marks on these questions. So the most common types of questions that you get linked to graphs are either describe the graph, use the graph to explain something, use the graph to calculate or using the data from the graph to conclude. So we're going to go through a range of these examples. Now your time is precious while you are revising, so I've put time codes at the bottom so you can jump to any of these in particular that you think you might need more help with. Now first of all, an overview of what we actually mean by these command words. So describe, you are saying what you see, but when it's linked to a graph you have to include data. So you might be describing between which set points on the graph there is an increase, a decrease, a plateau, a difference between means for example explaining you are saying why that pattern exists and this is where you would then apply your biology knowledge to explain the pattern calculate that's maths and then conclude is you are saying what the experiment and the graph actually tells you so we'll have a look at the first question and this is a calculate question so we're told that the glucose concentrations in different drinks has been investigated and the results are shown in our graph. So we've got five different drinks, the concentration of glucose in grams per decimeter cubed. So the first question is, use the data from the graph to calculate how many grams of glucose would be in 150 centimeters cubed of drink F. So the first thing just to be aware of is, they are giving us a volume in centimetres cubed. The volume that we have in the graph is decimetres cubed. So at some point, you will need to do that conversion. So if I was doing this question, that's the first thing I'd be highlighting. Then it's looking at um, F in particular. So that's the one that we are looking at. So first step would be converting the units, as I said. So 150 centimetres cubed is decimetres cubed. We need to divide by a thousand. So we're actually working out how many grams of glucose are there in 0.15 decimeters cubed. Now the graph, if we read off, that tells us how many grams there are in one decimeter cubed, but we have 0.15. So that is why we would actually do five grams, because if we read across, ideally with a ruler, but don't have one on the computer, we do five grams multiplied what we actually by what we actually have 0.15 so the answer is 0.75 grams the next calculate question that we have is calculate how many how much more glucose is in drink d compared to drink e so that's the first part the second part is you then have to turn that into a percentage so step one let's just find what the raw difference is so d if we have a look that is 15 grams per decimeter cubed, whereas E with your ruler, you'd read off and we have 10 um, grams per decimeter cubed. So we have a difference of five grams per decimeter cubed, but we need to say what that is as a percentage. Now, because they said calculate how much more glucose is in drink D compared to drink E, that is why we're gonna divide it by E because the way they phrased it, it sounds like E is your starting point and we're comparing it to D. So it'd be five divided by 10, multiplied by 100 because it's a percentage, so it's 50%. Now that would be how you do the calculation to work out percentage change. Now you might have been able to do that in your head if you are quite mathematical, just by looking at the fact that this one contains 10, this one's 15, Half of 10 is five, we've got five extra, so it's a 50% increase. So either way you did it, the answer is 50%. So next then, we've got calculate and explain in this question. Scientists measured translocation in the phloem of trees by tracing using radioactively labeled carbon dioxide. So it's an isotope um, 14C. 
the volume of 14C, uh, but this is a carbon isotope that's incorporated into carbon dioxide, um, released from the top and bottom of the main trunk of the tree was measured at regular intervals. And we can see that along here, the time after the labelled carbon was um, entered, it's carbon dioxide, and it says hours. So we've got hours as our time unit. So first of all, how long did it take the 14C, so that isotope, to get from the top of the trunk to the bottom of the trunk and explain how you reached your answer? Now this question, uh, what they're after is, you would need to go from the peak of your top trunk to the peak of the bottom trunk. The reason being is, and you don't actually have to explain this for your answer, but the reason I've gone from the peak to the peak is where we have this very, very high mean volume at the top of the trunk, we then need to look at where is the highest mean in the bottom of the trunk, because that will be when this um, set carbon actually made it to the bottom. And that's why I went from peak to peak. So that difference is 30 hours. So that is a calculate and then explain question. So it's a two in one, that one. Scientists wanted to calculate the mean rate of movement down the trunk, but what piece of information are they missing? So the rate is always product over time. And we do have here the product over time. However, they've also stated it's the movement down the trunk. So that is the missing piece of information, the distance, which is the movement down the trunk. So it was the length of the trunk or the distance of the trunk. So overall, the units would be the volume of carbon dioxide, so that's our product, per distance, per unit of time, which in this case would be hours. So question three, we're looking at the effect of temperature on the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction. Um, and that's what they've investigated. At each temperature, the reaction started using the same volume of substrate solution and the same volume of enzyme solution. So here are our results. We've got the concentration of product um, in the mixture in grams per decimeter cubed. And then we've got the time after the start of the reaction, and that is measured in seconds. So describe and explain the differences between the two curves. And this is a five mark question, but there is quite a lot of information to give here. So if we start with a description, this is where you say what you see. And this is describing the differences, remember, not just describing the two curves or lines. So the difference for 37 degrees C, we can see that there's a faster initial rate of reaction shown by this steep gradient. However, it plateaus after about 180 seconds. However, for the 25 degrees C, we can see the rate of reaction remains consistent the entire time, but it is a lower rate of reaction to begin with, shown by the fact that the gradient is less steep. So that'd be our description, but then we have to explain why we have those differences. So there's our description. Um, the reason then is why do we have that faster initial rate of reaction? Well, it's at a higher temperature. Therefore, there's going to be more kinetic energy. So that means you'll have more successful collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, or you could phrase that as, you'd have more enzyme substrate complexes forming, which is the key phrase to always include in any explained question linked to enzymes. The second descriptive point as the difference was the graph plateaus at 37 degrees C, but it doesn't for the 25 degrees C. So we've got to explain why it plateaus, and that would be because we've got a different limiting factor now. And in this case, it is the substrate. So by that point, all of the substrate has already been used up and the reaction has already occurred. So that is our limiting factor. So those would be your five marks. Question four, we've got another calculate. So you can see that you do get lots of calculate questions linked to graphs. The graph below shows the results of an investigation into the concentration of protein in blood plasma for people between the ages of 60 and 95. 
and the bars show one times the standard deviation above and below the mean. So we have males, females, we've got our standard deviation. Our axes are the mean concentration of protein in the blood plasma in grams per decimeter cubed, and um, we've got age in years. So we have to use the graph. Um, so what is the difference between the rate of change of the mean concentration of protein in the blood plasma in males and females between the ages of 60 and 95 show you're working? So it's quite a bit there just to get your head around first of all. So number one, we are working out a difference and it's the difference between the rate of change. Now, the rate is not on the graph. So that's one thing we are going to have to calculate, the rate of change. Um, and that is the rate of change of the mean concentration, which is what we have on our um, y-axis, um, of protein in the blood in males and females. So that's what we're comparing, males compared to females. And the time frame for our rate is 60 to 95. So step one, let's work out what the um, mean concentration um, rate is for females. So you need to work out the difference first of all before we then turn it into a rate. So the mean concentration was 71 to begin with in females and then that went down to 60. So that's a difference of 11, but that was over 35 years. So to turn it into a rate, we divide by 35. So 0 0.31 grams per decimeters cubed per year is the rate for females. Do the same thing, but for men. So we've got the difference in concentration is 69 minus 64. So it decreased by 5 grams per decimeter cubed over 35 years. So their rate is 0 0.14 grams per decimeter cubed per year. So that's the first bit, but they have actually asked for what is the difference between the rates. So the final step is working out what is the difference between 0 0.31 and 0 0.14, which is 0 0.17. And now the final step, when you give your answer, you do have to write down the units. And that is grams per decimeter cubed per year. And one thing, when you're working out the units, just think about what did you do to um, your answer? And that's what you do to your units. And what I mean by that is we did the y-axis divided by the x-axis. So that's what we need to do for our units. Grams per decimeter cubed divided by years, which you could just do the division symbol and write year there. But year to the minus one means per year. So it means the same thing. Okay, question five. And this is our first conclude question. Now, it's the same information as the question before. Um, so it's, again, looking at concentration of protein in blood plasma for people between the ages of 60 and 95. But this time, you are going to have to conclude something. So a student concluded from the graph that the protein content of blood plasma decreased with age more in females. So that is their conclusion. And you've got to say whether you agree. And it's two marks. Now we haven't used the standard deviation yet and um, if you are coming to a conclusion you do need to use standard deviation so that's the key thing that we're going to look at so this student has said that the blood plasma protein content decreased more in females now we did see that there was a decrease of 11 in females and there was only a decrease of, I think it was five. We said it went from 69 to 64. So yes, that is a bigger decrease. However, the standard deviations is going to be key here. And with the standard deviation, if the bars overlap, what that means is there is not a significant difference between those means. Now, it's normally represented as a bar chart. So this is actually quite different here. It's shown as a line graph. So although the mean here is different, we have um, for males, it's at 69, whereas for females, it's at 71. Their standard deviations overlap. So that is not a significant difference. And that is the same at every single age, except for um, 95. So that will be what the second mark is. 
that there's actually only a significant difference between the means at age 95. So although we have said that it decreases more in males than females, or sorry, it decreases more in females than males, um, none of those decreases are actually different until age 95. So that is um, what the second mark would be. So final question is an explain one. The graph shows the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curves for two different species, a human, which is species A, and a rat, which is species B. Now species B, which is the rat, is more active than species A, the human. And you have to use the graph to explain how the haemoglobin of the rats allows a greater level of activity. So this is applying your knowledge of what you know about more active animals and how their haemoglobin would differ and use evidence from the graph to support that. So the first piece of evidence would be pointing out that for species B, their oxyhemoglobin curve is to the right. So that's the first mark. The curve is further to the right. And what that tells you is the haemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen. And the way that we know that is if you just pick a partial pressure, so I'm gonna go for six, at the same partial pressure, which just so happens to be six, we can see species B um, is only 30% saturated, whereas species A is around 50% saturated. So because species B has a lower saturation, it must have a lower attraction, a lower affinity for oxygen. So that is what the second mark is. Therefore, it means the haemoglobin must be unloading or dissociating the oxygen more readily. Now, the underline here more means you would have had to have said that to get the mark. The reason being is species A is also unloading oxygen because it's only 50% saturated. So it has unloaded half the oxygen from the haemoglobin. However, the difference is species B is unloading it more because it is less saturated. So the reason that's an advantage is more oxygen, and again, you have to say more because oxygen is being delivered to the cells for humans as well. Um, so more oxygen is delivered to the cells, or you could say tissues, muscles for rat, the rats, the species B. And that then links back to what they've said in the question. The rat is more active. Explain how the haemoglobin allows it to be more active. Well, we've gone through points one to three. The final thing is, because there's more oxygen available, that means they can respire faster and therefore have that greater activity. So that's one thing just to be aware of. If you do have a comparison, you have to have more, more, and that comparative word in there. Okay, and that is it for my exam walkthrough for graph questions. I hope you found it helpful. If you have, please give it a thumbs up and add in the comments below any other questions that you would like help with or any other types of questions for exam question walkthroughs.